often considered a tragic victim of circumstance, the Lockheed L-188 Electra was a machine that illustrated great potential, even against the dedicated jet airliners that emerged alongside it. But due to unforeseen circumstances, in spite of rigorous testing and quality checks, a series of fatal crashes would destroy the reputation of America's first turboprop airliner. In the mid-1950s, the aviation world was undergoing drastic changes as technology developed during the previous decade finally began to emerge on a widespread scale, with turbine power having made its debut in Great Britain with the Vickers Viscount turboprop and the de Havilland Comet jet airliner, machines that quickly rewrote the book on fundamental civil aircraft designs going forward. While the Viscount was a massive success across the globe, the Comet was an incredibly contentious model due to multiple fatal crashes that soured confidence in jet airliners, with the likes of Boeing and Douglas, who proposed their own jet-powered aircraft, awaiting the outcomes of the investigations into the Comet disasters before proceeding with their own products. Turboprop power, therefore, was on a winning streak thanks to its perfect mixture of fuel efficiency, noise reduction, exceptional performance, and lower vibrations when compared to the preceding technology of piston-powered airliners, with the Lockheed Company of California being perhaps the best place to push this technology forward for the United States. At the time, Lockheed was one of the premier aircraft manufacturers in the country, providing an even mixture of military and civilian models that took the market by storm the C-130 Hercules transport aircraft becoming one of the most popular multi-role platforms in the world, while the L-1249A Super Constellation was the epitome of 1950s aviation glamour and opulence. In the wake of the Viscount's release in 1948, Lockheed had first encountered turboprop technology during 1951, when Washington DC-based Capital Airlines approached the manufacturer about a potential design, Lockheed ultimately turning down the offer which led Capital to purchase 60 Viscounts instead, thus sparking major interest in their own project. The scheme would begin dedicated development, following an outline specification being required from American Airlines, who desired a four-engine turboprop model that could accommodate 75 passengers over a range of 2,000 miles, followed by Eastern Airlines' own specification for a turboprop with 85 to 90 seats and a 2,500-mile range. With the finalized outlook being for a 75 to 90 seat turboprop that married fuel efficiency with improved high speed performance, Lockheed pulled out all the stops to create their new machine, producing three full sized models, one of which was built deliberately for destruction, with its overpressurized fuselage being slashed open by a remotely controlled stainless steel axe to test structural rigidity. The other full size models were put through tornado force wind conditions and were placed inside an insulated temperature-controlled structure that simulated the weather at 30,000 feet, with various monitors being applied to ensure that the upcoming airliner would be comfortable and robust at any altitude or in any conditions. Additional tests of the airliner's structure included the use of a compressed air cannon to fire chicken carcasses at the cockpit in order to break the windows as part of a simulated bird strike, though when this didn't work, artificial hailstones and steel pellets were used instead. With development progressing, American Airlines ordered 35 examples in June 1955, followed in September by 40 units for Eastern Airlines, while early customer clinics as to the interior of the machine received positive feedback, with the roomy, well-upholstered cabins exceeding the expectations of passengers. Commitments for a further 129 aircraft came from six U.S. airlines and three international carriers, along with one example for Allison engines as a flying testbed, all of which had been procured prior to the maiden flight of the airliner. While following its first foray into the sky on December 6, 1957, a further 19 orders materialized. The maiden flight of what was dubbed the Lockheed L-188 Electra, the second use of the Electra name behind the Lockheed Model 10 of 1934, took place two months ahead of schedule as well as being 14 days prior to the first flight of the Boeing 707 jet airliner, the smaller variants of which were to be the L-188's most credible competitor for coast-to-coast -coast runs across the continental United States. The L-188 in early tests proved itself to be a machine that possessed intuitive performance and handling, with its climb rate being of particular note as it far outstripped any comparable piston-powered equivalent such as the Douglas DC-7. 
Meanwhile, its excellent power-to-weight ratio, large propellers, very short wings and sizable fowler flaps that significantly increased the effective wing area when extended, meant the Electra's performance was unrivaled by many pure jet aircraft, with particular emphasis being on its exceptional short runway performance as well as operations in hot and high conditions. Seeing the success of the L-188 under testing, Lockheed proposed their new turboprop model to meet a 1957 specification requirement issued by the United States Navy for an advanced maritime patrol aircraft replacing Lockheed's own P-2V Neptune of 1945. With the Electra now entering flight, Lockheed offered a quick and easy conversion of their upcoming passenger airliner for military applications, requiring little in the way of modification. Thus, in April 1958, the company won a bid to provide the Navy with its new maritime patrol aircraft, leading ultimately to the creation of the P-3 Orion. In passenger circles, the Electra made its commercial debut with Eastern Airlines on January 12, 1959, followed shortly thereafter by American Airlines, Braniff Airlines, and Northwest Orient, Eastern being particularly fond of the L-188 and dubbed their new turboprop as the Golden Falcon Prop Jet Electra, with the term jet being used simply as an appealing marketing term for customers. Speed and performance improvements were immediately apparent with the Electra, American Airlines boasting that the 710-mile journey between Chicago and New York could be covered in a mere 1 hour and 41 minutes, shaving 75 minutes off the pre-existing journey time using piston-powered airliners like the DC-6 and DC-7. Unfortunately, the L-188's outstanding entry into service would be marred by tragedy, as on February 3, 1959, only 12 days after the entry of the type into service with American Airlines, Electra November 6101 Alpha, operating Flight 320 from Chicago Midway to New York LaGuardia, crashed 5,000 feet short of the runway into the frozen East River, killing 65 of the 73 people aboard. Following an investigation by the Civil Aeronautics Board, or CAB, the crash was attributed to pilot error, noting the crew's limited experience with the type, an erroneous altimeter setting, and marginal weather, with a cloud base around 300 to 400 feet with light rain and fog at the time of the incident. While the loss of Flight 320 was one potentially avoidable and couldn't be blamed squarely on the airliner, two subsequent crashes in September 1959 and March 1960 would completely destroy the reputation of the machine and spell the end for one of the world's finest turboprop aircraft. The first was Braniff Flight 542 on September 29, 1959 when during a short flight at 15,000 feet between Houston and Dallas, the wings of L-188A, November 9705 Charlie, separated from the fuselage near Buffalo, Texas, leading to the deaths of all 34 passengers and crew aboard. This was followed on March 17, 1960, by Northwest Orient Flight 710, as flown by Electra, November 121 Uniform Sierra, which crashed into the fields of rural Indiana while flying between Chicago Midway and Miami with the wings having once again separated from the fuselage, thus causing the deaths of all 63 people aboard. With three fatal crashes in the first 14 months of service, public confidence in the Electra was shattered, but with more than 130 L-188s already in service, the CAB was reluctant to implement a full grounding of the type, instead imposing restrictions on the aircraft's cruising speed to 316 miles an hour, thus robbing the machine of its speed advantage over the piston-powered equivalents. With two crashes having involved the wings separating from the fuselage, a series of rigid tests and inspections were undertaken based on the theory that the failures had perhaps been caused by excessive speed and torque, with investigations being conducted with the assistance of rival manufacturers Boeing, Convair and Douglas. The resulting Lockheed Electra Action Program, or LEAP, engaged more than 250 engineers working 24 hours a day to find out what the issue was with the L-188, the results of the leap finding that the Electra's engine mounts were weak and that depending on the speed of the aircraft, sympathetic vibrations were being transmitted through the wings, thus causing them to fail. With the root cause found, Lockheed moved to ensure rectification work was made at the first opportunity, the L-188's four-engine nacelles being identified as strong enough to resist whirl mode when they left the factory thus being the reason as to why the problem had not been discovered during the extensive testing and certification process. However, 
It emerged that severe jolting of the outboard nacelles, as experienced during heavy landings, could reduce their structural strength, weakening the engine mounts and sending vibrations from the loosened engines to the wing roots. Therefore, with Lockheed having already invested millions of dollars into the Leap, the firm spent an additional $25 million to set up a modification line, working with the airlines to establish a recall schedule where the L-188s could be taken out of service and repaired over a period of between 17 and 20 days each, with 165 units eventually being modified, while a further 30 were rectified during production. Sadly, though the Leap had identified the problem, and Lockheed were able to successfully rectify this concern, public confidence in the L-188 remained broken, and with the Boeing 727 soon to appear as the first domestically built short-to-medium-range jet airliner in America, carriers opted to abandon the turboprop in favour of the new model. The L-188, therefore, would remain in production until 1961, with 170 units eventually being built, while its flagship status on the transcontinental routes of the USA would be superseded by the 727 before the end of the decade, those examples surviving in the service of American carriers being put on sundry other work, including the Washington-New York shuttle flight for Easton. Come 1970, most Electras had been phased out of use by the mainstream American carriers, with the majority of the survivors migrating to South America, where they found work with carriers including Varig, Lap, and Lloyd Aero Boliviano while Oceania also benefited from redundant L-188s, with Trans-Australia Airlines, ANSET and Air New Zealand all operating the type. In Europe, only a single carrier operated the Electra, that being Dutch flag carrier KLM, who utilised 12 examples between 1959 and 1969 on services across Europe, as well as on some multi-stop international runs to Rome, Beirut, Cairo, Tehran, West Africa, Johannesburg, Kuala Lumpur, and Saigon. However, with their potential for passenger use rapidly diminishing as jets moved in to replace them, while more efficient turboprops such as the Hawker Sidley HS-748 could take over on regional hops to less developed airports, many were converted to cargo during the 1970s and 80s, the last known airworthy examples being two units in Canada for revenue work, while 14 are registered as aerial firefighters. In the wake of the L-188's failure, Lockheed would abandon its once pivotal position in the commercial aviation market for nearly a decade, only returning towards the end of the 1960s as they began work on their wide-body airliner for the 1970s, the Lockheed L-1011 TriStar, while the fallout of the entire debacle meant Lockheed would incur a loss of $57 million, plus an estimated $55 million in lawsuits filed by the families of those lost in the Electra crashes. However, the builder would find a crumb of comfort in the P-3 Orion anti-submarine maritime surveillance aircraft, which proved itself to be a robust design with rugged qualities similar to those of the Electra airliner. Lockheed's fervent attention to detail when it came to ensuring airframe rigidity made the P-3 one of the best all-weather aircraft in service, and is often used to fly into the centre of hurricanes for meteorological research, production of the type continuing until 1990 with 750 examples built, which today continue to see use with air forces across the world. In conclusion, the Lockheed L-188 Electra was a machine that didn't deserve the undignified fate it was ultimately dealt, as with the aircraft builder pouring as much time and innovation as possible into the structural rigidity of the machine, it was the cruelest of ironies that an airliner so rigorously focused on safety was brought to ruin by the disasters it was so hoped it could avoid. Nevertheless, as attested to by the continued operation of the P-3 Orion, the L-188, even with the onset of jet airliners, could have enjoyed a long and fruitful career with carriers all across the globe had public confidence not been destroyed with those first three crashes in 1959 and 1960, the Electra being a worthy airliner, but one tarnished unfairly, and thereby creating America's Comet.